Hi everybody. Uh, Bill and I did some running here uh, yesterday, which is Friday uh, the 15th of 2017, using the uh, physics package you see here, which is my fuser. And it seems that we have documented some actual recirculation and uh, uh, sort of ion mass spectrometer, ion trapping types of effects, <clears throat> for potentially for the first time in the fuser community. Uh, and this is based on some other observations which we made, apparently also for the first time in the fuser community, on things like time to distance, uh, travel time, and, and actual energy that was getting on the ions. And it turns out some other people's suspicions, and I will name Richard Hall here, that um, we weren't really getting our money's worth. Most of the ions were being created at the bottom of the potential well. We're correct. And with 50 kilovolts or so on the main grid, we were seeing an average energy on our ions of about 5 kiloelectron volts. Uh, pardon me if I use those terms interchangeably. Please don't cringe too hard if you're a real scientist. We, we all know what we mean. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, measured, we were measuring transit times in the 5, 10 microsecond range, which uh, over the size of this tank uh, implied the numbers that I was telling you with 50 kilovolts on the grid. So... Um, we decided to try, you know, the whole idea of, of getting recirculation when you're, when you've got a spring and a mass, uh, the spring being the Coulomb force and the mass being the mass, uh, with nothing but DC drive seems like ludicrous. Uh, like my guitar doesn't play itself. I had to pluck the strings. So, um, <clears throat> we arranged to have a, a drive, an AC drive. Now the frequencies that this gives us is, are all wrong and the voltages are a little on the low side right now. Uh, for real fuser operation, we're getting maybe 10, 12 kilovolts versus the 50 we normally run with DC. But um, <clears throat> we're getting neutrons with this. Hey, you don't need the $10,000 power supply, or at least not. Uh, we're, we're heading that way. Uh, this uh, lash up is giving us about uh, 10, 12 kilovolts peak at about uh, 68 kilohertz, which is way too slow, but we have to start somewhere. Now, you'll notice here there's a series capacitor to ground, which, you know, it doesn't matter where in the series circuit the capacitor really is. It's just convenient here. Um, and that's for an interesting reason. Our plasmas in a fuser are not neutral at all. They're heavily negative, as we've shown in previous data. And what happens whenever you try to drive a, uh, an element in the fuser positive is all the electrons run over there real fast because they're light. And act, it acts like a diode to ground, you know, a pretty good short circuit. So what happens is as soon as we get a you know, a few kilovolts positive on this grid, it starts drawing real current, which causes this capacitor to charge up. And so if we're making, um, say, 15 kilovolts or so peak to peak, about five of it goes positive and the other 10 go negative once the uh, charge and the capacitor is taken into account. We've shown this effect before in other situations. Now here we're only driving the main grid. The ion grid up here at the top is nothing is on there right now. We had a little boo-boo that burned out the coil, which has since been repaired. Now, other than the fact that this is a bigger coil with more pies on it, uh, the setup is, looks very much like this. This is the one for the ion grid. <clears throat> so you have your little sort of TV flyback transformer on steroids here, some plastic to keep things from arcing, you hope. And we're just using a really simple H-bridge uh, setup to drive it. It's like from the data sheet for the, the, uh, uh, the uh, International Rectifier part. And again, this is working here in this chamber where we have the main grid up here in the top center. This thing in the lower left is a 2.4 gigahertz antenna, but it also makes a pretty good Faraday probe. And this thing on the right is the ion grid when we use it. We weren't using it this time. Now, uh, to uh, show what we were seeing on the uh, big scope, it looked a little bit like this. Now, the purple waveform is the voltage on the main grid. However, this is AC coupled uh, separately by the scope. Uh, and by reality, it's actually we're just using a uh, proximity pickup. And you can see the top looking a little clipped. And what's actually happened is it's about one third positive of ground and the other two thirds are negative of ground. Now, where this becomes interesting <coughs> is the green trace, which is a Faraday probe, that, that antenna, which is, you know, it's an antenna. Um, it's just a wire sticking into the tank. Uh, and look at this. It, we're seeing um, little short bursts. You know, this is not linear, obviously, for the uh, input waveform. And whenever the uh, main grid is positive, uh, a little bit later, we start seeing these little short positive pulses on the Faraday probe, like as if the ions that we had originally drawn towards the main grid when the purple signal was negative came flying back out. Um, 
when it was positive. Now, this is what we see at these speeds and feeds 99% of the time. Uh, the neutron trace, the yellow trace there, nothing, right? And this just sits there looking like this. However, about every second or two, we get something that looks more like this. And here, let me bring this up. Maybe make it a little bigger. Okay. Now we're triggering on channel one, which is the neutrons. So we can see what happened leading up to one. Look at this on the Faraday probe. My gosh, we're getting multiple bursts of particles flying by the Faraday probe and have nothing to, well, not nothing to do with the drive signal. They're obviously synchronous with it, but they're not at the same instant, right? And there's some delay here. This is a short delay and then a long delay. And boom, this happens just before we saw a neutron hit. Now, this neutron detector is a Horniak detector that is numb as can be. Uh, for every you know million neutrons a second produced, we get 1,000 counts a minute. So it's, okay, <laughs> it's not very sensitive, but it's very accurate with time, which is what matters here. Now, <clears throat> what we're noticing, or one thing we're noticing is right after the main waveform goes negative, we get a neutron. Okay, and this, this funny pattern of not <laughs> the little skinny pulses, but, you know, little groups of them only happens when we trigger. We only see it when we're triggering on neutrons. So we can just go through a few of these. They're not all the same. And there's like zero chance that we hit the magic numbers for called a full mass spectrometer, penning trap or whatever by accident. In fact, I know I'm off. I mean, I just use what I could easily make, you know, try the easy stuff first. Um, you know, so I get the voltage I could get and the frequency I could get easily. And uh, we'll, we will obviously extend this considerably further because this really looks like something like recirculation. Now it's coming and going as if, uh, even though our signal is a little bit the wrong frequency, it's, it's like maybe you have a guitar string that you can make uh, feedback on a harmonic because you're, um, you, you get the idea, right? Something is beating here, okay? And even though we're wrong, we're, we're sort of, it, it builds up a little bit and gets to be right some of the time. So let's look through a few of these other waveforms that we got. Um, I'll bring it up here again, and, and here's another one. Isn't that interesting? Okay, now that's a big neutron. Whenever we clip the Horniak uh, photo tube, that means we probably got hit by more than one neutron at the same time, or very close to the same time. Um, and you see, ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. So this built up, and then at some point it made a neutron that the Horniak detector saw, which probably meant it was making neutrons for all these other times too, but the thing is really numb. It's a fraction of a percent uh, quantum efficiency. Um, so, but isn't it interesting that all now with this 68 kilohertz waveform or whatever that, whatever it is, we're getting double pulses here of, of ions flying by the, uh, the Faraday probe. So we keep seeing this. Here we go. I'll blow this up some more. Uh, here we see maybe one, two, three there. Boom. And a pretty loud burst of neutrons. Um, <clears throat> pardon my voice. My quitting smoking has other weird side effects. One of them being my mucus doesn't know where to go. <coughs> okay, here's another double pulse. A moderately good neutron. Notice the delay time also between the uh, negative peak and the neutrons seems to be a little less the taller this waveform is, which would make sense. The taller the voltage, the faster things go. Um, there we go. Now, we don't see as much pronounced as uh, weirdness on the uh, Faraday probe, but looky, we, we got pulses here. So... We're only seeing neutrons. I mean, we triggered a bunch of these. We're only seeing neutrons when um, we're getting this funny stuff in the Faraday probe, which I just think is interesting. So this is the first sign that I know of that anybody's documented anything that looks like recirculation. Believe me, we've done test after test after test, trying to shock this thing hard enough to even get a noticeable out-of-the-noise measurement of transit time between, say, the ion grid lighting off and the main grid seeing the ions flooding it. It was hard. And this looks to be fairly easy, and um, it's going to motivate some serious work here around the lab. Again, notice this is a small purple waveform and a longer delay to the neutron. Interesting. Hmm? Um, yeah, you know, so we'll, we'll try to get it right. Now, this is going to give me some hints, because look, we, these are not exactly periodic, but they're close. Okay, it looks like the later one takes longer, which maybe makes sense, because we're sort of going out of resonance or, or some such thing. Uh, we'll see. You know, this is just raw data, okay? So um, I've got my interpretation. Uh, here's another one that looks, you know, two pulses, boom, per thing, and centered around when we told them to go away. But by going positive, this waveform is saying, Ion, positive ions, go away. <laughs> and they went away, and we saw them on the Faraday grid. Boom, boom, boom. And we got neutrons. 
at some point just before they went away, which means they were at the grid focus at the time when we were making the neutrons. Is this cool or what? I know it took years to get this good data. Uh, <laughs> so here we go again. Ba boom, ba boom. Probably something in the middle here. It's, you know, it's in the noise. But okay. And less delay between here and here because the voltage was higher. Um, we tried this with you know, there's a couple little mild variations in the parameters that are sort of not important other than, hey, you know, we're trying to sweep the parameter space and learn stuff here. Uh, oh, look at this. And here we have, <laughs> boom, 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 three, okay? And something a little bit strange going on here. Uh, we weren't getting, by the way, any serious RFI or anything like that. I have no reason to believe that the instruments were lying to us. Um, and here we get another one like that. So um, I'll do again, boom. There's another one with several, okay? So uh, for reference, uh, let's go back to, I didn't want to shrink that. I want to go down to the other picture. Uh, here's the apparatus. Um, and of course I'm down here in the lower right. Hopefully these glasses don't make my head look too fat. Um, and we are putting that driving signal on that main grid in the upper thing, which from our perspective is the back. We're looking at a top view of this uh, through a window in the top of the tank. And the thing on the left is just a rod sticking through a piece of copper pipe that was happens to be tuned to 2.4 gigahertz. But for this, it's just a piece of wire in the tank as far as we're concerned. Um, so that's what's picking up this interesting signal that's getting the multiple humps. So ions, after they come flying out the end or out of here or where, you know, wherever they come out, and everything out here in the tank is more or less at ground at this time, uh, we're seeing st stuff go by. And in our earlier observations, we'd noticed something else. My, my initial assumption, and everybody's assumption when they talk about plasmas is, well, usually they're talking about denser plasmas than what we have over most of the tank, is that they're neutral. They're not. Uh, our plasmas tend to be hugely net negative because it's very easy to emit secondary electrons whenever ions bash things or, you know, hey, we're firing this tank up with an electron pump. Um, and it pumps out electrons and we get some. Um, so at any rate, um, we are noticing net negative uh, ions. And, and in fact, when our probe goes up, our grid goes positive a little bit, we're actually sucking those extra electrons out. But I had assumed that we had enough space charge that the thing was acting sort of like the viscous flow version of a plasma. In other words, every the charge density was so high that every charge was kind of seeing every other charge we had the standard plasma resonances and density and all that other crap. Well, it turns out that from some previous measurements, that's not quite the case. Um, we have actually, when we're doing this, different densities at different times and places in the tank. Out in the big tank, it's molecular flow. Nothing sees anything. It's uh, billiard balls, you know, you know, uh, sh shotgun uh, um, pellets or something. They don't touch, you know, they're just flying around. Uh, as we pull things in towards that grid, this, you know, symmetrically in the center, things get closer and closer together. They start to see each other. And so we're actually seeing it within the same tank, what amounts to two different pressures or two different regimes of plasma behavior. Uh, when things get closer, like inside the grid, they're starting to see each other and the Coulomb repulsion is starting to uh, happen big time. The charge of the ions is becoming commensurate with the, the, the grid in terms of affecting the uh, field in the tank as a whole, which makes the math in here especially difficult because it's nonlinear and it's uh, fractal. Its its output is its next input, uh, which is why I couldn't just you know name the numbers for the AC and the DC voltages and hit it right on the money on the first try, uh, because this math is essentially a much more difficult uh, version of the three-body gravitational problem where gravity has more than one sign, and <laughs> things have more than one ratio of mass to iner or gravitational constant to inertial mass. And we have, oh, by the way, 10 to the 18th and 10 to the 20th particles instead of uh, three. So um, this is, you know, a hard one. We're going to have to solve it somewhat by trial and error. But at any rate, so, the, you know, the rig to do this is fairly simple. Uh, this is just a very high turn ratio transformer that I, I wrapped up with Teflon tape uh, to get rid of arcs and glue plexiglass on and do all sorts of crazy things. Uh, all we're driving it doing is driving it with an H-bridge square wave at whatever frequency we can, we can get through it without things going up in smoke. Uh, this is a bigger version of the same thing. There's a great big old ferrite slug inside this white pipe. Uh, and here's the wires coming out on the left that go down to a thing that is below this, and it's being run on one of these uh, power supplies I recently did a write-up on. Um, and there's here's one of these H-bridges that will run the ion grid when that's not in a burned-up state. 
Later we plan to go to this uh, six tube RF amplifier to have a little bit more freedom of waveform, but that thing's sort of a pain and a little bit dangerous. So, so right now we're doing, you know, hey, the old troubleshooting rule, go check the easy stuff first. Um, so again, this is what we get when there's no neutrons happening. In, this is lit off, there's gas in the tank, nothing changes between this and this, except what we're triggering the scope on. And when we're getting neutrons, we see this. When we're not getting neutrons, we see that. So evidently we're getting some recirculation, more than one pulse per drive pulse is going by the Faraday probe and that's coming from someplace. So we may have the actual uh, dreamt of recirculation, if poor, uh, going on here. Um, and for the first time I've ever heard this uh, documented at all. So uh, hopefully we're contributing something to the state of the art. At any rate, I will leave the uh, fine interpretations up to you. Please don't roast me. I'm learning myself. Um, but it looks like we're onto something here. Oh, by the way, the, our previous threshold with the same detection gear for getting neutrons with a DC source was about 18, 19 kilovolts. We're now getting them, not very many, but we're getting them way out of the noise with more like 12 kilovolts. Now, if this will scale up the same way the DC scales up, we'll be at gain uh, <laughs> at some point here uh, because this is uh, many, many, many times more neutrons per, per sort of kilovolt uh, at, these, at these power levels uh, than we ever got with DC. So, and the nice thing about this so far is I'm able to run this at low enough power that I can be in the room with it, and that's a little bit of an advantage over running it from two buildings away with computers and trying to... You know, a knob is easier to turn than putting a mouse on something and trying to slide it up and down and, and so on. So, um, anyway, this is going pretty good. Um, and, uh, you know, just keeping up with the stuff that I burn out, right, and, uh, and trying to learn what we can learn from this. So, everybody have a good time. Um, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll have more video when I have more video. Take it easy, peoples.